Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to um, the session today. Um, thank you for joining wherever you are. Um, we will now start uh, with uh, an opening uh, poll. Um, we will have a link. We have a link in the chat. Uh, please um, open it. Um, they are in different languages and um, um, please share your answer with us. Start seeing some answers. Good to have Western Central Africa with us. Also calling from uh, Southeast Asia. Um, good to have uh, colleagues from the child protection education sector, but also seeing um, people from, from other sectors as health and nutrition. We have another question that is looking at um, who you work with. Um, two people have answered. Uh, we have two colleagues from international NGOs, one from national NGOs. Um, we have also a representative of UN or cluster lead uh, agency. That's great. Um, let's see if we have any donor. Someone is also answered from the chat. Um, well, um, Okay, we have, for those who participated to the, um, to the poll. Um, so today we are going to talk on why and how should the humanitarian system um, promote the implementation of multi-sectorial uh, initiative or integrated program that enhance child protection outcomes and promote localization. So we are going to discuss on how ensure the centrality of children, their protection, how prioritize it in uh, all humanitarian sector, from the donor to the communities as everybody play uh, their part. Next, please. Um, we will uh, use the opportunity to share uh, an experience uh, in Northeast Nigeria from uh, a consortium um, of uh, one international organization, Street Child, and three uh, local organization. Um, Growth Straw Foundation, um, Gender Equality, Peace and Development Center, and LABDI. Um, together, they implemented uh, between August 2021 and July 2022 um, an integrated education, child protection, and nutrition program between the states of Borno and Adamawa through the funding from um, uh, OCHA, uh, the Nigerian Humanitarian uh, Fund. The NHF, the Nigeria Humanitarian Fund, allocation was specifically earmarked to ensure that national NGOs were involved and could access uh, the funding by joining a consortium led by uh, an international NGO. Each of the organizations should, should focus on one specific sector, which aimed to have uh, an integrated intervention. Um, so this fund model was a pilot for NHF and the process had from personal experience, I was also involved um, in did some challenges for evaluating and approving proposal, but uh, with definitely great uh, lesson learned. We are lucky to have the representative for, from each uh, organization and from, um, from the Nigerian Humanitarian Fund. We have uh, four guests in this panel, and uh, um, I'm now pleased to introduce the, the first one. Um, we have with us George Swinimer, I hope I say correctly your surname, who is the Humanitarian Affairs Officer and the Nigeria Humanitarian Fund Focal Point from OCHA. Welcome, uh, George, and thank you very much for joining us. So uh, I would like to ask you, um, in Northeast Nigeria, currently there are 8.3 million people in need. In, um, and 60% uh, of them are children. In addition, in the latest CITREP, um, 
we see that there is an increase a number of children under five in the three states that are likely to face acute malnutrition this year, uh, about 2 million children. So as a focal point of the pool fund from OCHA, what the Nigeria Humanitarian Fund has done to prioritize the protection of children. Over to you, George. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Marcello. And um, good uh, morning, I believe, to colleagues. So, so my, yeah, my, again, my name is George Swinimer, and I'm the, uh, the head of the NHF, the Nigeria Humanitarian Fund, um, which is about, I'd say, probably about a mid sized fund. Normally, we, we get about $30 million a year in terms of uh, donor donations for the NHF and an additional. 30 million from CERF to different sources. Um, and to your question, Marcello, what we're doing specifically um, looking at child protection, with this specific, we're in the middle of a very serious lean season with a lot of hunger happening currently at the moment. So we have two, two parallel allocations happening. One with CERF that goes directly to the, uh, to the UN agencies. And in parallel, we have a parallel NHF allocation that is going to surrounding uh, sectoral responses linked to WASH, linked to nutrition, uh, linked to uh, GPV, and also linked to child protection as well. So we're in the process of launching this specific allocation that's linked to that. So evidently, we, we try to prioritize not just children, but women and children. And what we're trying to move towards as a model with the NHF, I would say, is, is a model that goes away from sectoral responses. I mean, traditionally, you give money to a specific sector. What we're trying to move towards is something more thematic. So a thematic response that you build outward from there. I have this concept we've been playing with. Uh, we were just talking to uh, women's organization groups yesterday. And the idea is we call it the girl onion model. So the idea is you look at one of the most vulnerable groups of people in any kind of intervention. So we'll take the example of a girl or the girl mother diet or the young mother, underage mother together with the child and in an environment that needs to be protected. On top of that, the idea is that you would build slowly but surely, what is the first thing you need to do to protect the child? Okay, you have the safe environment that's needed, but then also you need the nutrition factor. Then you need the education to build on top of that. Then the community might need wash and some kind of livelihood. So this is not something we are doing currently, but it's something that we're working towards in the future. So I think what we'll see and what we're trying to do with the NHF specifically is looking at more innovative approaches to look at, at, at areas of, of protection, specifically child protection, but other areas of protection. Um, over to you, Marcella. I'm not sure, again, for the timing, I, I think you have several questions. Let me stop there. I hope that, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, no, thank you very much uh, for, for, this, um, for this contribution. And I think, this is somehow also in line with the, the idea of the social -eco um, ecological approach of the, the child protection, like looking at, uh, you know, the different layer uh, around the, uh, the child and the, the, you know, the, also the risk equation, like the vulnerability and the threat to understand how to prioritize um, um, and make sure that there is holistic uh, intervention. Um, so NHF has moved step forward to promote localization and ensure that more local organizations can eventually access directly humanitarian funds. What has been the challenges and the lesson learned so far? Uh, and what do you see as the, uh, as the way forward? Um, maybe you can also refer to the allocation that brought to, the, to fund this um, consortium, maybe. Okay, thank the... you, Marcello. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, and localization, again, is a key theme with a lot of donors right now. I, I like to think of the humanitarian, there tends to be trends in the humanitarian world. So localization, I think, is the key trend of the day. So donors internationally are always giving in and trying to promote localization um, for very good reason, I believe. I think it's very context specific. In a country like Nigeria that has incredibly high capacity compared to other, other countries I've worked in. Localization is, is definitely, I think, the way to move forward, um, but we're doing it incrementally, so step by step. Currently, or in 2022, uh, the NHF allocated either directly or indirectly 45% of the resources to uh, nas uh, national NGOs. Um, we're aiming to increase that number by 5 to 7% per year, so step by step. Uh, piece by piece, because again, there's also, when we, you know, we have additional new partners, there's additional risks. So we, you know, we have to do additional measures to ensure that the resources are being used 
uh, well appropriately. It also entails a lot more work in terms in terms of checking for compliance, et cetera. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Um, and we're doing it cautiously. And we also say look, with every every single allocation or every time we meet donors is you have to look at, do it step-by-step. -step. Everyone thinks localization is just, you promote it, you go for it, and you don't think, you know, you don't question it, but it's a double-edged sword. And we're definitely committed to it, but in a step-by-step -step process. Um, we recently completed uh, a new partner intake where we have 21 new uh, new NGOs on board, 16 of which are national NGOs. So I think on our roster, we have something like 50 eligible partners uh, with the NHF. Um, localization isn't just a question of resources, because if I were to ask some of our partners, they say we've officially localized in Nigeria when 100% of our funding goes to the, uh, to the, to the national NGOs. Um, but I guess the second thing as well, what we're trying to do is to pull the UN system out of the NHF specifically. And the reason for that is because UN agencies have direct access to donors. They can speak to them directly. They can get funding. National NGOs getting funded internationally to national NGOs is a challenge because there's not often the appetite for risk per se. So what we try to do and we advocate for, and we also ask our NGO partners to advocate for it, talk to the donors and get them to give money to the NHF so that we can give the money to the national NGOs because we're one of the few mechanisms that allows us um, to, to, you know, to, to take on that risk for, for the donors. Um, in terms of the, I think I'll let everyone, uh, I'll let the partners speak about the allocation specifically. This, this consortium, consortium project was an interesting one. There was some definite successes. I think the street child one was definitely, or the, this, this specific group that's talking today was one of the more successful ones. Uh, and I think a lot of it depends on the organizations and the personalities per se. Sometimes you get consortia that get put together because people are looking for resources and this is the way to get resources. So they don't necessarily want to work in a consortia, but they come together in order to get their piece of the pie per se. But the example that we have here is a very good example where people work together collaboratively. Um, and at its best, it's fantastic. When a consortia works, People learn different skills. It's a two-way street. It's not necessarily the international NGO leading. It's a group that comes together and there's a dialogue and people are learning both ways. So I think it's important to understand that. And there's also in Nigeria, there's been also a push to form consortia that aren't international NGO, NGO, but fully national NGO. And again, we have different levels of capacities here. And I think there's a definite uh, possibility for that. It's a positive way to go forward, especially for the more experienced national NGOs. I'm soaking up your time, so I'm going to stop there and allow you to proceed with the, uh, the next question or panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, George, and congrats because you are great, uh, great in keeping time. Um, but I, I love your 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 statement, and think you know um, colleagues here from uh, National NGO might have also um, enjoyed to to hear that. Um, I think uh, apart from being a trend. Uh, or a fancy word localization, I think, you know, it's also a commitment that came from the humanitarian summit. So it's important that we move uh, steps forward. I also agree that uh, obviously there is need to prepare the ground in different contexts. And uh, yeah, Nigeria is, uh, has, you know, the, this journey that has brought um, uh, where we are with uh, good to hear, like having a uh, a large number of eligible partners that went through the, the due diligence. I think this is great and would be also important to see how the, the OCHA due diligence maybe might also facilitate their um, possibility to, to pass the, 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 the due diligence of other uh, donors, like an, a system of information sharing. Um, that's, that's great. And um, Good to hear that um, OCHA is also trying to to move the you know like uh, bringing the the UN um, pool fund slightly out of the UN system and more for for local organization and you know I can't be more uh, in agree with uh, with you. Um, thank you very much for for your contribution. Uh, please remain with us as we move forward, and um, I'm going to uh, have with me uh, Jumai. Jumai is the country director for Street Child in Nigeria. Um, thank you for, for joining uh, us and, uh, and welcome. Um, so Jumai, uh, I would like to know from your point of view, uh, Nigeria has a 
relatively quite strong civil society, as we also heard from, from George, with many local and national organizations who are requesting for more leadership and ownership of the response to provide the services and the protection of their people affected by the conflict, especially children. All these organizations have different focus and expertise and a different level of technical and institutional capacity. How street child approach to work with local actors is allowing, allowing to navigate within these differences while ensuring children and their family are receiving the best of the services they uh, require and deserve. Over to you, Jumai. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcelo, for the opportunity to speak on this uh, topic. I think uh, Nigeria has a very, very well established and vibrant uh, NGO community with over 5,000 organizations registered. Uh, these are ranging from small groups uh, working in local communities to larger networks uh, working at sub uh, national levels and also at national levels. So since Street Child in Nigeria opened our doors in 2016, we have been championing the cause of localization because we believe that a locally led and a locally delivered response offers the best opportunities to maximize the rich quality and sustainability of services for children. And like you rightly said, Marcelo, around the world, there has been growing commitments in terms of international development communities towards localization, empowering national organization actors to own and deliver uh, solutions to national development uh, challenges. And for us, uh, these commitments are very, very important because uh, it also serves as a rallying point for the world to focus on how we can strengthen the response across. And some of those commitments, like for example, the Paris uh, Declaration in 2002, uh, which commits to the development communities uh, uh, in terms of the principles of ownership, harmonization and alignment and results, and also mutual accountability between international as well as uh, national organizations or development actors. Uh, similarly, uh, in uh, 2016, the Grand Bagin also uh, pledges to improve uh, capacity development, coordination, as well as directing resources towards uh, national uh, level actors, especially those responding in the humanitarian uh, space. This uh, also includes the commitments towards 25% of funding that would go to uh, uh, directly to uh, uh, humanitarian actors, especially local and national uh, partners. Like I earlier mentioned, for us at Street Child, it's part of our core organizational principle in terms of working with local agencies. And this, I believe, contributes to our overall mission of creating the greatest impact for the most marginalized uh, children. And we work side by, by side with national organizations, just like you explained on uh, this, uh, 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 in terms of the work that we've been doing with the local partners. Our work is centered around uh, a framework, a localization framework, and which I'm going to be presenting shortly. So in terms of that, what we, uh, we do in terms of the localization, it's based on three strong pillars. One, it's towards uh, ensuring that we are catalyzing, uh, we are creating capabilities and also capacities of uh, local organizations and also national organizations. We're also catalyzing, helping them to catalyze funding flows to their organization. And a uh, the third pillar also looks at uh, consolidating local leadership. And one 
we mean here is in terms of increasing capability as well as the capacities. So we believe that in increasing these capabilities, it also increases their chances of applying for funding as well as absorbing funding. And also this leads to uh, increase in terms of their ability to raise resources to also be included in some of this coordination platform because we believe that it gives them more voice and status, leading also to uh, their uh, engagement within those local, uh, local uh, leadership structures, which increases their influence, representation, as well as resource mobilization. So this also leads to what we call the last pillar, which is catalyzing funding. So if they have good representation, they'll be able to increase their funding base. And when they increase their funding base, we believe that within that would also be flexible funding, which will further give them the opportunity to create more capabilities. Uh, thank you very much, Marcelo, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Chumai. Uh, I have a second question for you. Uh, if you briefly um, um, can uh, provide your, your feedback. Um, so Street Child for this project we are going to present has worked with two, um, with three different partners, uh, Jebatsi, Grostron, Labdi, um, and integrated new important component as uh, nutrition, for instance, that was, uh, relatively new for the for the organization, um, and was important considering the level of malnutrition in Northeast Nigeria. What has been the process to ensure that um, the the entire consortium, the four organization, could work effectively together with the focus on the centrality of children, their protection. Uh, thank you very much, Marcelo. I think uh, for us here uh, in Street Child and working with our partners is to ensure that we have a holistic response that responds to the needs of children within the humanitarian context. Uh, George has already clearly uh, painted the, the, the picture in terms of uh, what is currently happening with the uh, within the context. And uh, right now in the, the base states, the three states where we are responding, there are over 4.2 uh, million people that uh, currently need food assistance, and out of which uh, 2 million children are predicted to be acutely mal malnourished, uh, especially within this lean season. And this situation also has also increased the number of children that also will be experiencing severe acute malnutrition. We're looking at close to 700,000. And this necessitated uh, the need to look at a more comprehensive multi-sectoral response to issues rather than working uh, uh, towards uh, tackling one, one problem, but looking at it from a holistic uh, angle. So in Street Child, we have adopted that type of multi-sectoral approach in delivering some of our key uh, interventions. This has also led us to diversifying our partnership base. So just be beyond working with actors in education protection and also in the nutrition sector, uh, I mean, the livelihood sector, we decided to also look at how we can incorporate the uh, nutrition actors as well. And that led us to working with partners such as LABTI to provide that holistic uh, programs for children. And in terms of the process, I think for us, what is the underlining uh, success factor? It's looking at working uh, based on some of Street Child's core uh, principles of partnership. So for us, we look at ensuring that all our part in all our partnership, we have shared values. So uh, shared commitments to the greatest impact for, for children. We ensure that we uh, respect and uh, trust is also the center of the work we do. We acknowledge the value of each of the partners that we're working with, looking at our complementary values and also knowledge and skills of the different partners, pulling all the best of those uh, uh, values, knowledge and skills together to deliver uh, quality programming. We're also looking at uh, issues around accountability and transparency between uh, the partners. So transparent communication, timely delivery, effective interventions and all that. 
another key uh, principle that holds the entire uh, consortium together is also around flexibility and adaptability. So we are building partnerships and programs that are not only locally rooted, but also adapted and responding to the changes in the context and the needs within uh, the communities. And finally, also it's around participation and learning. We believe that we're evolving in terms of uh, the, the, the consortium partnerships. We're also learning as we grow so we're also infusing that learning so that it delivers clear evidence-based beneficiary-led programs that builds on beneficiary consultation and feedbacks as well as our partner impulse which we hold very very clear uh, very very dear and this has shaped our partnerships with all our local partners and we do not just talk the talk, but we also walk the work. Thank you very much, Marcelo, mm -hmm. over to you. Thank you very much, Jumaya. I love this um, last statement. And thanks you also to bringing the, the, the principle of partnership. Um, we had to reach contribution from, uh, from uh, George and Jumai so far. So you will now see in the chat a link to a Jamboard. And uh, I will please ask uh, all of you who have questions for them to open the link on your uh, preferred language and um, leave questions uh, uh, there. We will see if there's something that we want to address quickly or we will collect to respond them to a final, um, final session of question and answer. So um, if you have you know, hot question you want to ask now, please uh, do it. Otherwise, if something comes to me, uh, your mind, you can also uh, continue to add in the Jamboard um, uh, during, uh, during the session. Uh, in the meantime, there is uh, a question here um, directed to, to George um, and say that during the 2022, uh, the Nigerian Humanitarian Fund first standard allocation, um, only 1 million was allocated to the CPOR. Um, what is NHF doing this time uh, around uh, to increase this allocation and also prioritize more funding for child protection programming? George, sure, I can, over to I mean, you. I, I can jump in that. It's a very specific question uh, for Nigeria specifically. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of things boils down towards funding. And we're in a very tricky environment in Nigeria um, in that a lot of donors are looking at Nigeria and they say, look, we have problems in Ukraine. We have problems in, uh, um, in Sudan. So very much resources. And Nigeria is a wealthy uh, middle-income country, serious oil wealth. So we always get the question, uh, when are we going to stop funding Nigeria? We even had with this food security challenge, we had 15 humanitarian coordinators from around the world sitting at a specific meeting. And we were actually asked, there were people advocating that Nigeria should get no money because countries like Somalia have much higher need for resources. So we're in this, just to illustrate that we're in this constant battle to get resources here. So this year, for example, we currently have about two thirds of the resources that we have last year. We're hoping that that will be rectified. But, you know, we need, you know, we have a whole series of sectors with only so much we can do at the end. A key thing, and I guess while I was listening to other people speak is it's very important that national NGOs advocate to the international donors as well to fund pooled funding mechanisms. Because, and I just came up with this slogan, monetize so we can localize, you know, and I, I want that to sort of be picked up because it's like, we have donors that are saying, we are behind the localization agenda. Come on, do what you can on localize. Yet, we only get 4% of the overall humanitarian response money. And we're supposed to, with the grand bargain commitments that Jumai mentioned, we're also supposed to get 15%. If we have 15% of money resources coming into the pooled funding mechanisms, we can then localize much better. So we also have to, I think, push back to donors. And I hope there's a few sitting here at the same time. Yes, we are on board. We want to localize, monetize us so that we can help the local organizations. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, George. That's um, that's a strong one. I, I don't want to be in your shoes when it comes to location and prioritization. 
but um, yeah, uh, obviously we have the Nigerian hub joining here, so that's uh, that's uh, you know there is interest. So uh, it's justifiable this uh, specific uh, question. So thank you very much for uh, for question. We want now uh, to give participant three minute break. We know that it's important also to to stretch your legs and arms, grab a cup of coffee or tea. But at the same time, um, there will be um, another link in the chat. I told you from the beginning, this was going to be very uh, dynamic. Um, we have a, a question for you. We want to uh, know what's the one thing that you have learned so far during this first um, half of the session. Uh, take, you know, you can answer why you, you're drinking your, your tea or coffee. We are going to have three minute break and see you soon. Please don't go away or don't go too far. <laughs> Welcome back and thanks for the producer on the um, uh, choice of music. Uh, that was very, very lovely. I really enjoyed it. I was almost close to uh, dance. Um, so, uh, Welcome back, and I'm now going to um, have with me um, Patricia Dolly. Patricia is the executive director or of uh, Gender Equality and Peace uh, Development, JEPATSI. Um, welcome, Patricia. Thanks uh, for joining us. And um, I would like to know from you. So JEPATSI in this consortium uh, had the responsibility to provide access uh, to quality and protective education uh, to out of school children. What education can do to bring the protection of the, ch the children at the center of the humanitarian response and how can the sector catalyze the possibility to work effectively with other sectors to achieve child protection outcomes? Please, Prof, um, you are on mute. OK, That's thank you so much, Marcello. Uh, it's nice to be here on this, uh, on this panel. Well, like uh, George and uh, Jume had earlier said, 50% of, uh, of the IDPs are actually uh, children. Uh, and education and uh, child protection are critical uh, needs of children within this uh, uh, crisis in the Northeast. Uh, the link between education and child protection is something that is well known. Uh, we look at education as a tool for the protection of uh, uh, conflict affected children. Apart from the cognitive development of the children, uh, education plays a role of getting the children off the street and uh, which is associated uh, protection concerns. Uh, and I'll give you an example that in the notice crisis, during uh, a lot of educational facilities were destroyed and uh, children who were in the IDP camps, thousands of them were found on the streets and they had nowhere to go because of the uh, inadequacy of the formal education system. And so we had to come up with a, a construction of the transition learning spaces to be able to cater for these uh, uh, children, to take them away from the streets where uh, the protection concerns are really reduced when they are in the school. And I think another uh, area in which education uh, contributes to the issue of protection is about knowing their rights. They are taught about their rights. They are taught about the social, uh, negative social norms. They are also taught about gender equality as something that uh, is a no-no-go area within the environment in which we live. So they are taught about all those ones and ensure that they are caught young, begin to know that the issues of gender equality and respect for women and all those and how to challenge patriarchy within their environment as they are growing up. They also look, they also talk about issues of uh, respect, issues of non-violence and issues of peaceful coexistence within the school because the curriculum of the IE, IE uh, ed, uh, education in emergency actually comprises all those issues within those uh, curriculum and also the education materials. They are also taught they have, they have access to uh, life-saving uh, health and uh, security information. Uh, for example, uh, cholera is something that uh, occurs every year within where we, we operate. 
So issues of hygiene, issues of sanitation, both uh, personal environmental sanitation are part of the curriculum. And also it builds their self-esteem and resilience and enables them to cope and to recover from traumatic experiences that they have, that they have gone through as a result of the crisis in the, in the state. Identification of children as well in the school environment is something that is always ongoing because uh, people are able to identify the children with protection, uh, uh, protection uh, concerns and also refer you know, for services, psychosocial services, such as PSS or MHPSS and other uh, issues. Uh, talking about the second, uh, the second question, I want to say that Education is the entry point for all the sectors, whether it is protection, whether it is health, whether it is uh, nutrition, whether it is food security uh, and livelihood, whether it is a uh, 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 shelter. Education is an entry point. But however, the link between education and child protection is very, very complementary and is also uh, 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 very critical because we find that with education partnership between education and, uh, and child protection will lead to uh, outcomes or stretched outcomes, sectoral outcomes of both education and child protection. And why am I saying this? Both education and child protection are child focused. Also education happens to be a priority of the impacted communities because communities know that education provides a safe environment for their children. And secondly, they strengthen each other's sectorial outcomes because we found out from the NHF uh, this that the collaborative synergy between us as groups of uh, organization, actually we achieve more better outcome in our own various uh, uh, sectoral uh, 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 areas than if we, have, if we had uh, 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 implemented it as sole individual like Jeopardy just going alone in education, Labdi just going alone in nutrition, and then Go Strong going alone in uh, protection. Bringing us together, we have we achieved a better a better uh, a result than if we had gone solo in our various sectorial uh, areas. So we we found that bringing us together, partnership in, uh, cutting across the various sectors. We found that uh, the intervention gave rise to col collaborative energy, and this resulted in more efficient, better targeted, and more effective programs. Ultimately, this led to a better outcome for the children and for the young people. Over. Thank you very uh, much, Prof. Uh, I can't be more in agree uh, with you. Um, and actually, come to my mind, uh, a uh, uh, personal experience in a recent training where there were um, representatives of the Swiss aid agencies, where he was saying that, you know, within their policy, they're bringing education emergencies as a protection fund. I think that's a, that's a great um, approach um, that uh, should be as an example for also um, uh, other donors. Um, so from your perspective, how the localization agenda is advancing in Nigeria. And uh, in this NHF allocation where each local organization had a focus on a specific sector service, what did you see as the advantage of having uh, an international NGO like Street Child leading the consortium? And what also the disadvantages? Thank you very much, uh, Marcello. I would like to state here that the localization process has come a long way from 2016, the grand bargain. Um, at the earlier stages, like about three or about five years ago, I think national NGOs were considered as subcontractors. And that means projects were designed and then given to the local NGOs to implement. We had no input in the design of the project. We didn't know anything about the budget of the project and so on and so forth. We've gone a long way from that. We've come to uh, a more equitable partnership and transparent partnership with uh, INGOs. We are now more like co-designers of projects, co-implementers of projects, and then uh, partners in the project. Uh, the INGOs have come to recognize the fact that no monetary contribution is as important or as critical as also monetary con contribution. And they've also come to understand that 
uh, the, the, the knowledge of the terrain, both cultural, religious, and geographical terrain is as important as the funding that we get from the, uh, get from the INGOs to be able to carry out these uh, activities. Another way that uh, we have come a long way is the fact that national non-governmental organizations are also beginning to co-lead uh, co on the subsectors. They are also be becoming part of the strategic ad uh, ad uh, ad advisory group. Some of them are also part of uh, the joint education needs assessment. And we also know that the leadership of clusters actually is very critical, or it's a critical step in the localization uh, uh, process. We have direct increase, or we have increased funding from, uh, from the NHF. Initially, the NHF was uh, disproportionately skewed towards INGOs, and very few uh, non national non governmental organizations were having access to the funding. But I can say now that more uh, national uh, organizations are grantees uh, of uh, the NHF uh, allocations than we had in about three to four years ago. Apart from that, I think uh, we also now know how to navigate the due diligence. And this is because of the capacity that we have received you know, from various organizations. And I know that sometimes before the allocation, allocation or the call is made, OSHA actually makes a call in which they take various organizations through the, the processes. We've also had capacity building from organizations like a Street Child and other organizations that we have worked with building our capacities. You know, so we find out that uh, the issues of accessing that now has become a lot easier with uh, proposal writing being uh, part of the capacity building from various organizations. We've had the PILCAP, we also have the EU Act, you know, that have actually built the capacity of various organizations, especially the women-led organizations in the, in, the, in the Northeast. There has also been a lot of mentoring and coaching uh, 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 coaching of national NGOs by international uh, NGOs. I think one of the problems or one of the issues that they had with uh, national NGOs at the initial stages was the issue of capacity, because they say that we didn't have a capacity to be able to manage the resources or the huge resources that would be coming to us. But I think that also has been taken care of because of the capacity building and the resource strength or the system strengthening, you know, that have gone into building the capacity of the local uh, uh, NGOs and also most of uh, the INGOs now have developed their uh, strategic framework for localization. Nigeria also has a strategic framework for loca localization. And the question that I need to ask here is how aligned are all these are the NGO framework and the Nigerian framework? And there's a need to look into that to see how they, they work together as we go into the into the future. And also the some organizations Rough. have connected have connected their partners. Uh, with uh, direct funding from other donors. Over to you. Uh, uh. Thank you very much, Prof. And uh, probably um, I will keep part of this question also about uh, not disadvantage, but like challenges towards the end. If we if we have time, I want to provoke uh, you and uh, and our colleagues. Um, thank you very much for for your contribution. Um, and please, if you have question continue to access the, the Jamboard and, uh, and post it there. Uh, we have now with us the Executive Director of Growth Strong Foundation, uh, Yusuf uh, Abba. Yusuf, welcome. Um, thanks for joining us. And uh, well, starting from the contribution of uh, Growth Strong Foundation this, in this um, uh, NHF allocation. The organization provided uh, child protection services, um, had preventative and response um, initiatives. Now, considering the, the centrality of children, their protection, what the, the, the child protection sector can do to make sure that um, multiple sectors work effectively in integrated ways to address the multiple, multiple needs, multidimensional needs of the children, and enhance their uh, child protection outcomes rather than working in silos. Over to you. Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Marcelo, for the introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, as Marcelo have clearly indicated, as well as George and uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. have said enough with regard to how we will link uh, in terms of integrating our program. 
But however, coming to my questions, like uh, looking at the context now we have, specifically the conflict affected region of Northeast Nigeria, you know, single programming is more cost effective and, you know, it is not easily being funded. But however, based on the uh, consortium program we lead, as you can see very clearly, where we combine child protection uh, integrated with education as well as nutrition, which makes that there are three expertise come together to implement uh, one program. So, uh, and then it can be the same beneficiary. And in some instances, beneficiaries are cutting across, across both nutrition, education, as well as uh, CP intervention. And this all goes into our case management process. So from the child protection uh, minimum standard, we have standard four, which talk, talks about working across sector, and which is one thing that if uh, more INGO or donors would like to adopt, and this will reduce the cost of uh, uh, the cost of uh, implement, uh, sponsoring a beneficiary one. And then also, it will also make the work very effective. The idea behind it is that we have expertise of child protection, and then JPAC has an expertise of education, and then uh, LabD have an expertise of nutrition. Just look at it now. We come together, make referral among ourselves and manage this individual case approach according to the need of this very beneficiary. But I would like to post a little bit here to hear from the communities to see well how the impact of our intervention was when we implement the 2022 uh, NHF consortium program with Stretcher. So let's watch this video colleagues and then we we'll get back to you on that. Sumu fa ini ya akan cewa watu GSF kungiya ce wanda ta zo taimakon al'umman jiddare kuma jiddare ta amince da su ta karbe su da hannu biyu da yake muna da alaka mai karfi da su ta fannin jituwa ta wajen yare da sauran su meme da haka ake to GSF ta zo mana da abubuwa da dama kamar yadda take zo taimakon yaran mu a uh, da wato yara basa da irin wadansu ababuwan da suka samu a yanzu din yara zaka gan su ne suka tashi suna tafiya ba tare da wani tsare tsare ba amma GSF tun zuwan ta ta zo ta kama na tsari da dama yaran mu idan suka tashi a makaranta suna samun tarbiya ta gari da sauran su kuma al'umman jiddari gaba daya suka bada hadin kai a wannan al'amarin dan saboda wannan al'amarin ya fifita yaran su haka ma basu bar hatta marasa wato wadansu irin mutanen da dai hankalin su dai a tabe kadan da sauran su yara kanana ma GSA ba ta bari ba ta zo ta taimaka da yake mutane ne wanda ba sa iya wadansu abubuwa amma aka involve din su a cikin wadansu abubuwa din nan mutanen nan suka samu abubuwa da dama wanda da ba sa da shi haka kuma aka tallafa yaran jiddari GSF an ga community volunteer da yaro shi da je kuro <laughs> kashi kashi h by h o gananya h by h o gananya sayaro a wata rana san ma wadda ya turam a wata ya tarana sayaro je ga wata yaro aji da yana duri koren sayaro a yi rawo ngo bi ke ngai raye da h group zaro sai gananya kuro h group ga jama'a bi ke ji lima ne bi ke ngai raye kuro sai gananya aka da h group 0 to 17 na san ma so h by h o gananya Allah sai ya koren a yi bi kero rawo an gwa wun gai a nera ya sai ra kujin hatta yumlan ya amsa ta awan za ta inviting je isa so uh basically uh marcelo this is a testimony from the community and indicating the importance of community based approach in implementing uh, integrated uh, program 
So I uh, you know the two speakers are basically from the community. One is the Child Protection Committee member, and the other she's a uh, community-based volunteer who support uh, the implementation of the program. So why we remove this video is to just to showcase that, okay, this is one important of localizing an intervention. And when intervention is localized, language matters, acceptability matters, as well as sustainability matters. In short, this program continues even in the absence of the grant when NHF, uh, when we, st we stop, the program come to an end and this sustains even beyond that. So I would like to first year to have any other questions that is needed, over. Thank you very much, Yusuf, and thanks to, for bringing also the, the contribution from um, community, uh, from the community. Um, I will like to keep my second question for you um, for later, uh, just to recover a little bit on time and uh, move forward with our next um, activity. So we have, again, a link to, to the Jamboard in case um, you have more questions that are also coming after the, the contribution from Professor Patricia and, uh, and Yusuf. Please, um, we give a couple of minutes for you to open the, the Jamboard and um, leave um, your question. In the meantime, to give you more time, uh, I saw already some question uh, from the, the, the first half of the session. And there is um, one still for George. Uh, I want to direct for George. Um, is about funding, obviously. And uh, what is your take on having integrated approach in fragile contest? and in having it funded for a long term. Um, so maybe if you have any uh, challenge or lesson learned, especially knowing that often the, uh, the Nigerian humanitarian fund are um, for maybe short term or up to uh, a year. What's your, what's your take here? Sure, thank you, Marcello. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, what I go back to again, it's always sort of a question of, of financing. Um, the one part of the question you mentioned, you know, integrated approach, I'm definitely for integrated approaches, I think. And I think even the broader humanitarian system will probably move into that direction. You know, we've had this clusterized approach uh, since humanitarian reform, but what I found also that, you know, you get this very siloed approach to solving problems. So I think we need to move more towards Area-based thematic approaches towards uh, solving things. In terms of in terms of the duration of project, that's uh, that point. With the we're just in the process of adopting the new global guidelines for country-based pool funds, and we're making the Nigeria version of that. So that's going to allow at least the possibility of two-year funding. So it is it will be possible should we agree lo locally that this is a good option to do that. So it will be an option to do longer-term projects, but we'll have to see if that's something that will make sense in our specific context. I mean, with the Nigeria Humanitarian Fund, we shouldn't be seen as a mechanism that is a continuous stream of funding longer term. We should be something that either starts something and gets continued by another source of funding or as a tool for, for trying out new and innovative approaches to things. So I think people often look at us as a main overall funding or gap filler, but that's not what our role uh, should be or will be looking towards the future. Um, what it is positive from the donors, we're also advocating from the donors who supply to us to get multi-year funding from them as well, because that allows us to have at least a better picture of what our funding looks like in the next year. Previously, we used to get funding on a year-by-year -year basis, so we never knew if we'd, if we'd have money the next year or any money. So it's always that question, you know, is the resources going to come in? Will it be similar? Will it be less? Um, but we now have the Swiss, the Irish... Uh, the Germans and I believe the Canadians, all of them have committed to multi-year funding. So I can say for next year already, we already have a third of the resources. We know we should be getting in the pipeline a third of the resources that we have uh, in a typical year. So that helps us being able to plan these sorts of things as well. But again, it, it, it does come down to a question of, uh, of, of the resources at the end. So um, over to you. 
Thank you very much, George. And uh, it's great to hear also about uh, the possibility of seeing a two-year funding from, from NHF. Um, we are getting you commit, <laughs> launching some important steps. I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, no, it's great to hear the, 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 the process behind and uh, the thoughts um, and you know the, the commitment that we are putting uh, we are putting to uh, promote uh, localization uh now uh there are a few more questions but i want to again keep um for for later to move to our next uh activities and uh, we would really like to um, um all of you here participating to um to, to go into a breakout room is voluntary but um, we are a small group of um, uh, practitioners and uh, we will encourage you um, to, to participate. Uh, in these uh, breakout rooms, and um, you should see soon the, um, um, the we will have one room um, where we want uh, you guys discuss about what could or should um, whether we are talking about the donor community, whether we are talking about uh, the national NGO or the international NGO or the cluster system. So, um, um, you know, trying to address the different uh, stakeholders uh, that are contributing to promote localization and, and, uh, and integrated approach that put children at the center of the response. So what could or should this group do um, to um, uh, yeah, to promote more integrated initiatives and uh, more leadership of local level actors. Um, we have about six minutes for for this um, session. Please um, join the uh, the breakout room by opening the link. Good morning, guys. Or good afternoon, we're pending. Um, yeah, uh, do you have any um, any any idea, or maybe share your your experience on you know uh, something that is working well, that is promoting local organization getting more involved and uh, being able to um, access fund to implement a project in 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 your contest. Do you have maybe things that are working well and things that are not that you can share with us? Yes, and we shouldn't just focus alone to funding and then let's look at the issue of partnership and the issue of capacity, accessing capacities, etc. among other things. So feel free to share your experience. And then uh, like Marcelo clearly mentioned, what works well and what doesn't uh, work well. Over to you guys. Or maybe we can just start quickly with the, because of the time, we can start with the Nigerian hub and then we'll come back to the others. Nigerian hub, over to you. I hope you can hear us all right. Um, yes, yeah, you have any way of Yes. Okay. So you can just talk among yourself, discuss among yourselves yeah. what no. works well with regard to local capacity in accessing resources, either funding, capacity, or partnership, and what does not work well. Thank you very much. I think that's basically what we are discussing right now. Okay, fab it. So we have just less than a minute. Please uh, you can quickly do your discussion and then get back to the group. Then uh, Adama Baba or uh, Abayrima, do you have something to share? Or Abu Bakar Sadiqau, we can over to you. Maybe if you have something to share, an idea. All right. Thank you. Um, Great. I think we have all the participants back in this um, in this uh, in this room, in the plenary. Um, 
I saw we had uh, a larger uh, number of participants uh, joining the, the, the NGO group. Maybe it will be great if we can have um, one, one person sharing some, uh, you know, some contribution that came out from the, um, uh, from the discussion. I can help on that because I, I was taking notes, um, if that's okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. My name is Prili. I'm from um, Nigeria. I'm based in Nigeria as well, from Premier Sargent International. So really glad to meet my Nigerian colleagues here. So we came up with uh, four um, recommendations, at least. Um, first is to build a localization framework at the country level. So it gives pressure for the INGO to um, to do uh, yeah to implement the localization and work with the local organizations, also to continue building the capacity of local NGOs so they are ready to implement um, the, um, the, uh, the the project um, on their own without the dependence of, um, with the international NGO. Also to yeah like really um, create real equal partnership so not limiting ourselves to include partners as uh, just implementing or implementing organizations but also to really honor their um, strengths um, also to include the national and local organizations throughout the whole project cycle so from project design until the uh, monitoring and evaluation and last but not least we just get one more input in the jump board which is to assure partnership and collaboration um uh, yeah uh, as in, in um in parallel with the continuous mutual learning and capacity strengthening um so i think that is all from my ngos i don't know if my colleagues from the same group would like to add anything um but thanks for yeah, the opportunity yeah captured it all yeah mm -hmm. great um we also had um two participants in the uh cluster lead agency group um um i don't know if anyone would like to to share any uh, contribution from the discussion? I'll do that. Good morning, Thank everyone. My much. name is Zaudi. Um, well, what we discussed very, very briefly was saying that um, at the cluster level, especially, I think that this is where the bridge with other clusters happens. So the UN uh, led uh, cluster should be promoting itself an integrated approach uh, by by not a joint programming, which is what is happening actually on the ground, rather than integrated. So really bringing up the voices also of local NGOs in the whole process. And uh, what we were saying as well is that being the protection sector quite underfunded compared to others, rather than collaborating with sister sectors, which is education or GBV, which is classically the typical um, collaboration, but to link as well with those more challenging, um, so it could be FSL, uh, for instance, and which so far we don't have yet not much guidance, for example, in guidelines. So um, that could be an entry point as well in changing the narrative of, uh, of funding, for instance. So the cluster could be that. Um, and then a costed model as well. We were talking earlier on about sustainability. Uh, I think it's under the cluster responsibility to sort of understand how much this is going to cost and bringing up at the donor level. Um, this reflects very much what we said earlier on with the consortium um, type of, uh, of model. And um, yes, to pay a lot of attention to integrated rather to joint programming, which is something which sometimes it's, um, it's very easy to confuse. <laughs> in a nutshell thank you yeah thank you very much Zeldi, and uh, and uh, and i agree with you and talking about you know costing i think um i, I had recently i was reflecting working on on some proposal how um for instance also the the multi-year approach has been somehow more um understood and donors are more uh, open to to go for multi-year funding um in, in humanitarian contest but sometimes you can see that the allocation is still the same for you know what you could do in 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 a year, especially if you want to really, you know, uh, work in a, a socio ecological uh, through the socio ecological model. And we know that for a protected environment, you can't 
um, you know, prioritize something on the expense of, uh, of others. So um, yeah, the costing, it's it's quite important also as a, as a advocacy piece. Um, I would also like to get maybe some input from the Nigerian hub. I know that we're working uh, together there. Um, do, you, do we have any contribution from, from there, please? Our point is to be done. No, we are not going to be done. So, we are 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 going to be done. Okay, so we can see. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, we have a few points here that we have highlighted. Uh, what could be done to improve or promote uh, integrated activity uh, with the children at the center of uh, our interventions? One, uh, it's very important, and uh, look at NGO network leaders. You know, are included in the humanitarian advice report. Uh, that's to have adequate representation on artificial media level. Uh, you know, uh, so that we uh, have to inform uh, our peculiarities as a country uh, so that donor can understand our peculiarities and um, the need uh, to have uh, better funding for effective intervention. Uh, so also, we are also saying that our advocacy messages can go directly uh, to donors for increased funding for local organizations to provide child protection services, particularly uh, in humanitarian uh, settings. Uh, also, we are also saying that um, International non governmental organization uh, should be dedicated to also share their exit plan, you know, uh, with local NGOs to ensure sustainability uh, and continuation of project interventions. Because most of the times, local NGOs do not even understand what uh, the exit plan of the international non-governmental organizations are. So when they do, you know, everything ends there. And um, another point we have also raised here is that there should be synergy uh, between uh, the Northeast Development Commission that is responsible uh, for the, uh, the, 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 what is it called? That, that is responsible for the no, yeah, for the reconstruction of the region. You know, there have been crises for many years. So the North East Development Commission uh, is it's a government establishment that is responsible for the construction of the region. So now a time of uh, front energy between this commission and the Nigerian Ontarian form. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. The past also require capacity building on all of that. Thank you very much. So uh, I really appreciate all uh, groups' contribution. As we have only um, one minute left, I need to hand over to um, the producer. But uh, really, I um, I liked also the the, the point on the the X3 strategy. I will promise that I will keep the questions that were shared on the Jamboard and share with uh, with our panelists and uh, and uh, and ask them to respond and share with the alliance um, to in case we have channels to to share with the, with the audience. Um, I would like to to finish with uh, uh, what George said about uh, monetize uh, monetization for for uh, localization uh, monetize for localize. I think um, you know it's uh, it's uh, all uh, it's all um, all stakeholder uh, job. Everybody play their uh, their part, and uh, 
yeah, um, um, you know, we were just touching on introducing the, also the role of the government. Um, so yeah, let's let's play our role and uh, funding. Obviously, it's uh, it's um, it's key to 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 move um, the the snowball. Uh, thank you very much all for your participation, and I wish you um, a great rest of engagement at the Alliance Annual Meeting.